through here, right down through here. See, this wasn't here. This is all grown in. This was an open field like this. And I went down. 79-year-old Bill Bullybush is a lifelong resident of the Kecksburg area. For more than 20 years, he kept a secret from his neighbors in this small rural community. That one December night, he believes he saw an unidentified flying object over Kecksburg. Little did he know that many of his fellow citizens believe they saw the same thing. Nobody can change my mind. I know what I'm saying. And that, that was it. December 9th, 1965. It's about 4.30 p.m., just before sunset in Kecksburg, which is about 45 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Bill Bullybush has just come home from work. As his wife prepares dinner, Bullybush heads outside to work on his pride and joy, a 1964 Chevy Corvair. He listens to the car's CB radio while he tinkers under the dash. And I heard guys from Ohio talking on there, and they were jabbering, they were coming east. And they, they said that they seen this thing too going east, you know, and they wondered what it was. Bullybush suddenly hears a hissing sound. He looks up, catching a glimpse of a glowing object in the sky. To get a better look, he gets out of his car and can plainly see the bright object overhead. Yeah, I, I watched it, and it, it was just like a big fireball. Then it was headed towards the mountain. And they come back a pretty good piece, and the first thing I know, it made a U-turn and went down into Kecksburg, down in the woods there. Less than two miles away, 16-year-old Robert Blystone sits on the back porch of his parents' home. He also spots the strange light. It was just a round fireball. You know, flames all around it, with these different color vapors behind it and it just started slowing down like it was being controlled and the next thing i know it's beyond the hill where i can't see it no more but I, then i started seeing like smoke dust coming up out of the woods so i kind of fear it kind of crashed across town bill bullybush jumps into his corvair and drives to the kecksburg woods At the top of the hill overlooking the woods, Bully Bush stops, then turns on his parking lights so he can see into the valley. A strong smell of sulfur permeates the air. As Bully Bush makes his way down the hill, he hears a sizzling sound. I could see it down in the valley there, and uh, that's, that's where it, it landed, right in there. It knocked the top of the trees out and everything else. So I stood there for, well, I'd say 15 minutes looking at it. Meanwhile, 12 miles away in nearby Greensburg, the switchboard at radio station WHJB jumps to life. WHJB, could you hold on one second? Office manager Mabel Mazza answers the sudden flurry of phone calls. People were telling me something fell in Kecksburg and uh, somebody said it was a ball of fire. Somebody said it was a plane wreck. There were just a number of stories that kept coming in. The phones just kept ringing. When Mabel fields a call from someone claiming to have seen a UFO outside Kecksburg, she hands the phone to John Murphy, the station's news director. Hey, John. Yeah. I said, here, you take this one. John Murphy. All right, what what what'd you see? And he came back and he said to me, he said, this is a big one, kid. I'm going to Kecksburg. Wait, wait. Your camera. Thanks, kid. See you later. WHJB. Back at the crash site, Bill Bullybush is trying to decide whether to move closer to the smoldering object partially embedded in the ground. The color of it was like a burnt orange. It was burnt from the front clear to the back. And I could see this ring around the back of it. And it looked like Egyptian writing on the back of it. There was no windows in it, no seams, no rivet marking. It was just a solid piece. 
Bully Bush fears the smoking object may explode. So after 15 minutes, he retreats. On the way to his car, he hears curious residents already gathering outside the woods. Bully Bush climbs into his Corvair and returns home. Within an hour, the area has been cordoned off by a growing number of military personnel and local officials. They refuse to let onlookers get closer to the mysterious object. Though they have a limited view, the group can see a plume of blue smoke rising from the forest. 19-year-old Bill Weaver is out for a joyride in Kecksburg when he hears a radio bulletin describing a strange light in the sky. Intrigued, he heads to the south side of the woods, an area that has not been secured by the military. Weaver finds a handful of people there, peering into the wooded valley. We thought it was a Russian satellite at first. But at 19 years old, I was still curious. Actually, I went back in there, was out of curiosity to see if there was something that did land there. In the waning evening light, Weaver says that he and the others can barely make out the object below. It looked like it had plowed into the ground somewhat. Radiating off, I don't know if it was the front or the back or side, was a blue light, much like a welder's light. It gets real bright and then it gets dull. It would go back and forth. As Weaver and the others try to get a better look, he says officials move them further back, away from the woods. Around 6.30 p.m., Bill Bullybush returns to the scene, this time with his seven-year-old son, Ricky. I never seen so many people, and the Army was there. I couldn't figure out how the Army got there so quick. The Army kept everybody away. About an hour later, WHJB newsman John Murphy arrives on the scene. He sneaks into the woods and secretly takes a few photographs of the strange object. No more pictures. Accounts differ, but those close to Murphy believe some key photographs are confiscated by officials. He begins recording statements from a number of people. What you are about to hear are excerpts of the actual interviews Murphy conducted. What it look like? Can you point out what part of the wood you saw it in? Right down there. Down in there. Was there any smoke coming from it? Yeah. Murphy calls in a bulletin to his colleague Stan Wall, WHJB's evening disc jockey. I'm out in the woods here outside of Kecksburg. It's bright and there's smoke every place. Okay, John, I'll give you, uh, you're going to be on live in like 30 seconds, okay? John didn't like to go on the air if he wasn't certain with something. He, he didn't like to speculate. He gave us different opinions on what it could have been. As the evening went on, people really became anxious to find out what really happened. Then we had other radio stations and TV stations and so forth calling about this thing that had landed in Kecksburg. A growing military contingent continues to clear the area of onlookers as Murphy tries to collect more eyewitness accounts. About an hour and a half later, at 9 p.m., Bob Gatti, a 22-year-old reporter, arrives at the scene from the Greensburg paper, the Tribune Review. Along the road were state police, and there were some military people there, and uh, I believe they were army people, and they had guns. They were keeping people from going back into this field. Robert Blystone is less than a quarter mile from his parents' home. From there, he sees a flurry of activity. A large flatbed truck, accompanied by army jeeps, disappears into the wooded valley. Almost two hours later, the convoy emerges. But Blystone notices that the flatbed is no longer empty, and he sees what the military is trying to hide. And you can see on the flatbed a design 
under the uh, tarp, like a bell shape or a acorn shape vehicle that was under there. Robert Blystone isn't the only one who sees this strange cargo. By the next day, several eyewitnesses tell John Murphy, Bob Gaddy, and others that they saw a strange object in the sky that they believe came to Earth. The front page of our local paper, the Grazer Tribune Review, had big headlines on Army Ropesloff area, unidentified flying object falls near Kexpert. But another article in a later edition of the paper suggests that the eyewitnesses are mistaken. In that piece, state troopers say they have recovered, quote, absolutely nothing from the site. According to at least one researcher, this story and later statements make eyewitnesses suspect a government cover-up. The question still remains, what was this object? Uh, and we've been trying to track down to get answers to that for many, many years. The people want to know the truth. They want to know if we're alone out there. December 10th, 1965. One day after about a dozen people near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, witness what they believe was a UFO crash. Many are surprised to read in their local paper that government officials have discovered no physical evidence. They made a thorough search in the woods and there was nothing there, and that officially the government was saying now that people have been mistaken, nothing had fallen to in the woods. Stan Gordon is a local UFO researcher who has studied the Kecksburg case for nearly 40 years. He was 16 years old at the time of the incident. Gordon and others will challenge that conclusion for the next four decades. In the days following the events of December 9th, local radio station WHJB's news director, John Murphy, gathers the eyewitness accounts he had recorded that night. The journalist is intrigued by the tapes which indicate that something fell into the woods outside Kecksburg. The following is an excerpt from Murphy's tapes. You a described explosion? Well, I seen two big bright flashes and a long streak of orange light. I figured it was a plane. He decides to produce a documentary about that night. Murphy titles his project, Object in the Woods. John had me help him write up a story, and he wanted to make sure everything got in there included. And he was real excited. For several days, they work on the program. Murphy also listens to his interviews with local authorities. We checked in with the Pennsylvania State Police to find out how right an area this report had come in from. Oh, my. Uh, as far as Canada, in Ohio, it's been seen all over. Uh, these flashes have been coming all over the northeastern United States. But just a few days before Object in the Woods is set to air, to two men identifying themselves to Mabel Mazza as government agents visit Murphy at the station. We wanted to let them talk privately, so we put them in the FM studio, so the men went in there with John and closed the door. Mabel says the meeting lasts about 30 minutes. For some reason, John Murphy was afraid. He just said, I can't talk about it. I cannot talk about it. And he said, just, just leave me alone. He sort of lost some of his spark. And I have no idea what it was, but it was after the visit of those two men. But the excitement in John was completely gone. And when I tried to question him on it, he didn't want to talk about it. Murphy moves ahead with plans to broadcast Object in the Woods. The show airs on WHJB in late December. But the documentary that listeners hear is not the one Murphy had intended. Object in the woods. I say to him, I say, John, that's not what you said the other night. Well, he said, I, I have to change it. You know, I said, well, why do you have to change it? But he would never tell me. 
when it was aired, it was absolutely not the same documentary as it was prepared. At the beginning of the broadcast, Murphy advises his audience that his report has been edited. We regret that part of the program had to be censored and other parts of the program had to be cut out entirely. Despite his meeting just days before with the men who tell Mabel Mazza they were with the government, Murphy asserts that there has been no official pressure to alter his production. This station has not been contacted by any official agency of the state, federal, or local government in connection with this program. Murphy instead explains that the program has been changed because some interviewees became nervous about having their statements broadcast. We received other calls early tonight from some other people who said they had changed their minds now at the last minute and did not want the statements they had made over this past weekend used on this radio program tonight. In the years that followed, Murphy never discusses his meeting with the two men or his decision to run the edited version of the documentary. I don't think John ever became his real self then again because uh, it's something that lingered with him. Years later, Murphy's ex-wife remembers the importance he placed on the Kecksburg event and the effect it had on him personally. And this is like the story of his lifetime. I mean, it's the way he treated it. And all of a sudden, nothing, not a word. Well, it was totally unlike him to drop something like that. She also maintains that authorities confiscated some of the photos Murphy had taken in the woods that night. I know John had pictures of the object. He told me he did. He wouldn't lie about that. It's too good a story to pass up. Whatever secrets John Murphy held about that mysterious visit, he took to his grave. In February of 1969, Murphy was struck and killed by a car on a highway near Ventura, California. His dad gave me the police report to read. There was too many things in it that didn't make sense. For the next 20 years, the events of December 9th, 1965, seemed to fade from public memory, only occasionally becoming the subject of talk for Kecksburg area residents. Nevertheless, Local researcher Stan Gordon is committed to collecting whatever information he can find. I would periodically get a relative of somebody who was there that night, somebody knew something else. Most people that have experiences don't want any publicity. They're afraid of being ridiculed and for various reasons they don't want to go public. In the mid-1980s, one of Gordon's colleagues unearths a Project Blue Book report concerning Kecksburg. The Air Force developed Project Blue Book to investigate all reported UFO sightings and determine if they were a national security threat. From 1947 until 1969, the study gathered more than 12,000 reports, 700 of which were classified unidentified. Though the report erroneously cites Acme, Pennsylvania as the location, Gordon knows that it refers to the crash in the Kecksburg Woods. While it's possible that the formerly classified file will finally shed new light on the events of that night, after nearly two decades of waiting, Stan Gordon is not surprised with the military's explanation. The Project Blue Book report basically states that a search was conducted until about 2 a.m., that only three Air Force personnel were involved in the search, and that nothing was found, and that officially people had seen just a bright meteor in the sky, that nothing had fallen to the ground that day. Gordon doubts the veracity of the Blue Book report. He's talked to eyewitnesses who describe a much larger military presence at the scene. So here you have military personnel coming in to other people's private property. They're preventing other civilians from going down to other people's property. They're stopping and turning them around. So what was so important down in those woods that the military didn't want those people to see? Gordon looks for eyewitnesses, but many are reluctant to come forward. Then, in September of 1988, Stan Gordon gets an indication of what the military may have been hiding. Through an anonymous tip, 
he finds truck driver Bill Bullybush, who is now 62 years old. And these symbols, how well did you do? Bullybush, who Gordon believes may be the first person to see the object, has kept his silence for 23 years. During that meeting, Gordon takes Bullybush out to the Kecksburg woods and has him retrace his steps from that night. He took us down from top of Media Road down through the woods, went behind the tree, said, this is the tree I stood behind that night, pointed over to the spot. Bullybush's account matches that of another eyewitness Gordon has interviewed. Each man independently describes the solid, windowless object with strange writing along the sides. Bullybush also tells Gordon of the large amount of military personnel, mostly army, he saw that night. That memory, Bullybush says, has stayed with him because of the impact it seemed to have on his young son, Ricky. You see an army in a picture in the movies, you know, and that, but to, to see him out in real life at seven years old, it really, really fixed him up. Gordon believes the strongest evidence that something occurred comes from objective eyewitnesses. You have not only civilians who report as seeing military personnel, but you also have reporters as eyewitnesses as well who reported seeing military personnel on the scene that evening. Bob Gatti is one of them. They had rifles. I come from an army family and I know what an army uniform looks like. And uh, I, I believe it was army. I'm not sure how many altogether there were. It impressed me at the time that there were quite a few. I know it was Army, for one thing, because I could see the star on the truck that showed that that was Army. Mabel Mazza, WHJB's office manager, okay. remembers receiving phone calls at the station from people identifying themselves as military authorities that night. Within about an hour, of the phones ringing, I had uh, military personnel call me on the phone and ask me the directions to Kecksburg. And they wanted to know what I knew, and I said, I don't know anything, I'm just taking the phone calls. Thank you. They just weren't coming from one direction. They seemed to have uh, just all come in at one time from all directions. In 1990, as the 25th anniversary of the Kecksburg event nears, the story garners national media attention. Several of the eyewitness reports that Stan Gordon has uncovered are featured. The press coverage helps reignite the debate about what really happened in Kecksburg. As I've looked at many of these stories that associate space events, satellites, re-entries, launchings, with UFO reports, I've been struck by how often they are connected By 1991, the strange occurrence outside Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, more than 25 years before, continues to be the subject of speculation. Could it have been a UFO? Based on what witnesses described, space consultant James Oberg believes he may have an alternate explanation for the Kecksburg object. They talked about an acorn-shaped object. And as a spe specialist in Soviet space history, I realized that wasn't a bad description of the re-entry capsule on the Soviet Venus probe. In 1965, NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, tracked Cosmos 96. NORAD knew that the satellite's Venus probe re-entered the atmosphere the same day as the Kecksburg event. But the Soviets didn't acknowledge that the mission failed. Cosmos 96 was a Russian probe to Venus that got stuck in its parking orbit. The rocket failed. It never got any further. So it fell back to Earth and burned up. Cosmos 96 was part of the USSR's Venera project, a 22-year study of the planet Venus. NORAD lacked the technology to determine exactly where the craft landed a mystery that the agency says remains to this day. Oberg thinks the Kecksburg object could be Cosmos 96. To test his theory, he seeks out the Air Force tracking data from December 9th, 
1965. The Air Force keeps very detailed historical records of satellites in space. Oberg believes they may be the key to solving the Kecksburg mystery. But when Oberg examines the data, he finds a key inconsistency between the Cosmos probe and what happened in Kecksburg. At the time of the Kecksburg sightings, the flight path of Cosmos 96 was nowhere near Pennsylvania. People around Kecksburg reported seeing the fireball in the early evening around 4.45 p.m., as much as 13 hours after the Cosmos 96 re-entry. While the probe was believed to have entered the atmosphere over central Canada, NORAD now thinks it could have been as far away as the Indian Ocean. Oberg maintains it is possible that the Air Force intentionally released misleading data on Cosmos 96. Perhaps if it was a satellite and it did come down, the Air Force released false tracking data to camouflage this fact. Oberg asserts that in the tense Cold War atmosphere, U.S. officials would have had every reason to keep such a find under wraps. But by the year 2000, when he has access to more accurate data, Oberg finally dismisses the Cosmos 96 theory. The coincidence of the satellite coming back to Earth the same day that this object was found in Pennsylvania, it was very tempting. Later on, better tracking data allowed us to see that this was not, in fact, a connection. It was a pure coincidence. Still, he maintains that other satellites can't be entirely ruled out. There are candidates from spacecraft, Russian, and our spacecraft. The 60s was a period of very intense aerospace activity. Lots of stuff in the air, lots of it falling out of the air, and a lot of that really, really secret. Stuff that took years to come out, if it ever did come out. It is possible, Oberg asserts, that a piece of a craft, often referred to as orbital debris, or space junk, survived entry into the Earth's atmosphere and landed near Kecksburg. People don't realize how much of the space junk that fell back to Earth survived. We have struts and, and beams and, and insulation fragments that have re-entered the atmosphere. Most satellite burns up. These pieces survive, hit the ground. And those pieces that did hit the ground were, would be of immense interest to military intelligence officers. Still, Oberg considers that an unlikely scenario. For Stan Gordon, the space junk theory still fails to fully explain what eyewitnesses reported and what he's come to believe. I'm convinced beyond any doubt that an object of unknown origin did fall from the sky and apparently the military came and recovered it. We've heard everything. One witness told me years ago that a Gemini capsule had been expelled in the area that night, even though no information on that has ever been found. One witness indicated that he had information that the object was a projectile fired from a giant gun from a railroad car in Canada. We have something unidentified, and the more we eliminate the possible options for it, the more mysterious it becomes, and the more intriguing the question becomes as to what it actually was. Leslie Kane is a journalist working with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, a group funded by the Sci-Fi Channel that has taken on the Kecksburg case. We have scientists down there that have actually been able to prove that there was something in those woods that came down. Still, in 1992, an amateur astronomer unearths long-forgotten evidence, which he believes settles the matter once and for all. We have evidence now, I think Kecksburg is a closed case. In September of 1990, a nationally broadcast television program features a segment on the Kecksburg story. Robert Young, an amateur astronomer and lecturer at a Pennsylvania planetarium, becomes intrigued by the case. He delves into newspaper articles and re-examines eyewitness reports. He later publishes an article declaring that there's nothing unsolved about the Kecksburg case. The elements of this story that might suggest that there's something unusual happened. The armed troops 
an armed convoy, the object itself. These stories only come from a very tiny handful of people. Young suspects that those early reports from the night of December 9th may have simply been blown out of proportion. Hoping to learn more, he tracks down Ed Myers, who was Kecksburg's fire chief in 1965. Ed Myers told me that uh, while there was a search and a lot of people were there, that nothing was recovered and there weren't large numbers of military people. Young collects 150 eyewitness accounts from newspapers and his own interviews. They indicate that the official explanation is the closest to the truth. That nothing fell to earth and there was no major military presence in Kecksburg that night. Myers also accounts for the blue lights seen in the woods. There were some high school kids who were running through the woods flashing a camera strobe, which created blue flashing lights. Then, in early 1992, Young discovers an academic paper published in the August 1967 Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Von Del Chamberlain is one of the two authors who suggests that the light seen over Kecksburg was a fireball meteor, a celestial occurrence notable for its intense brightness and visibility over a large distance. It was seen over several states. It was very well observed throughout lower Michigan and especially southwest Ontario over by Windsor. Chamberlain and his colleague were able to map out the trajectory of the fireball by using these two photos of the object's dust trail taken by photographers in Michigan. We were able to use these because the photos were taken from two different places. They had landscape features so that with the photographers we could go back to the place where the camera was. Eyewitnesses Bill Bullybush and Robert Blystone have maintained that the object seemed to make a controlled landing into the Kecksburg woods. Von Del Chamberlain says these accounts are likely an illusion that's easily explained. Typically, when a bright fireball occurs, people who are out on the periphery of its observation will believe they know where it came down because the fireball is still glowing, still bright in the sky when it goes to or even beyond the visible horizon. So it will look like it came down beyond the nearby buildings or trees. Chamberlain says if a meteor makes contact with the Earth's surface at all, it can be several hundred miles away from where eyewitnesses believe it came down. Chamberlain and Young conclude that the Kecksburg event was most likely a typical fireball meteor. But what of the descriptions of the object making a series of S-turns over Kecksburg? Well, the, the trail is left by dust particles uh, in the atmosphere by the, the meteor that's coming in. The winds move the trail around as if you're looking at the contrail of an airplane uh, a few minutes later. And this contrail was visible for 20 minutes. Some people reported a half hour that they could see it in the western sky. So uh, lots of chance for the thing to assume other shapes. Leslie Kane, however, maintains that this argument ignores what some witnesses say was a significant military response. And the military wouldn't behave like that if a meteorite had come down. I mean, it would have been known fairly quickly and they could have let the media know that this is what it was. And Stan Gordon, a UFO researcher who has spent nearly 30 years investigating the Kecksburg case, says the eyewitness reports provide compelling evidence. I've interviewed hundreds of people who have direct or indirect knowledge about the case. And it's not been easy to find some of these witnesses because the majority of them didn't want any publicity. And what's so intriguing is the fact that so many of their statements and the information they have verify other people's accounts. In 1992, Robert Young challenges Gordon to re-examine the facts. I sent Stan Gordon a copy of the Chamberlain Krauss paper and it had the photographs. And I asked him for his comment, how does this affect this particular story? Never heard from him again. 
But Gordon claims that Robert Young refuses to accept the eyewitness accounts of credible people. Investigative journalist Leslie Kane has pursued the case since 2002 and believes it's not a meteor. There's too much information that doesn't add up. In 2003, production began on a television program about the Kecksburg UFO. The Sci-Fi Channel funded CFI, or the Coalition for Freedom of Information, to research the Kecksburg incident. It's time that... CFI presses for the release of related government documents. They have every right to this information. Leslie Kane is the group's co-founder. She describes her mission as that of an objective investigator, not a UFO hunter. I'm trying to stay right on track as a journalist that all it means is that we don't know what the object is. Kane doubts the official explanation that the object residents saw over Kecksburg was a meteor. I'm sure there are many, there are scientists and others that believe that that's the most likely explanation for this event in 1965. The problem is that there are so many eyewitness accounts that describe a physical object coming down. She believes that the reports of eyewitnesses are key. Among them is Bill Weaver, who remembers a heavy military presence in and around the woods that night. You know, these people that are saying that nothing happened that night, that they never seen any uh, military there. Either one, they weren't there, or two, they aren't telling the truth. Because this did happen. In an effort to determine scientifically if an object came down in the woods outside Kecksburg, the TV program includes a study by Dr. Ray Hicks of West Virginia University. A professor of forestry, Dr. Hicks examines the rings on a core sample of damaged trees there. He studied those trees and went inside them and he was able to document that this was actually caused by f something physical and he was able to date the damage back to the year 1965. And this is very, very significant proof, or close to proof, smoking gun as it were, that there was a physical object that came down. And yes, indeed, that object is an unidentified flying object. The result of Dr. Hicks' testing appears to support the eyewitness account of Bill Bullybush. You can see where it laid the trees over on the tops, knocks the top right out. They were all bent the way it came in. Kane and CFI also re-examined the Cosmos 96 claim. She retained the assistance of Nicholas Johnson, NASA's chief scientist for orbital debris. Johnson reconfirms that Cosmos 96, a failed Russian space mission, was not what fell in Kecksburg. In an email to the History Channel, Johnson says he searched the U.S. satellite catalog. It revealed that Cosmos 96 was the only cataloged object to re-enter on December 9, 1965. It was not a missile. It was not an aircraft. I thought that was a very, very powerful statement because he said everything is cataloged, even if it's a somewhat sensitive military experiment. Robert Young dismisses the significance that Kane and others place on eyewitness accounts and points to the photos as the strongest pieces of evidence that the Kecksburg object was a meteor. They don't have anything except some stories against uh, physical evidence, the pictures. Over the years, the media attention has taken its toll on this rural community. Some say a definite rift remains between those in Kecksburg who believe something fell from the sky and those who don't. You got relatives who one was involved, the other one says this is bull, nothing happened that night, who don't talk to each other, some still don't talk today. Bill Weaver remembers feeling pressured not to talk about his experiences that night. It was just something that's secret. You'd be damn near a communist, you know, to, to uh, talk about something like this. CFI continues to press for documents from agencies that might shed light on whatever happened in Kecksburg on December 9th, 1965. We are proceeding with both Air Force and Army investigations, and we have every intention of, of filing lawsuits against those agencies 
at a certain point if we do not receive satisfactory response from them. Kane cites the example of Project Blue Book as evidence demonstrating that the military is unwilling to reveal the truth. Uh, at one point, there's an interesting section in there in which they uh, say that uh, the media has been calling and the head of Project Blue Book says, you can tell them it's a meteor, but the, the document goes on to say, but we're still investigating the case. With Leslie Kane, CFI is a participant in a suit pending with NASA in hopes of forcing the space agency to release any documents it may have on the Kecksburg case. A previous request for documents in 2003 yielded 36 pages of what CFI calls irrelevant material. These are American citizens who deserve this information, who have every right to this information. Many of those who were in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania on the night of December 9th, 1965, agree. I'd really like to know what did come down. Because I can tell you, it was no meteor, that's for sure. Because it was being controlled. Anybody that saw it could tell you that. I don't believe the government will ever tell us the truth and until generations down the road. My grandchildren may know. The trouble is, we're all suspicious. And if their evidence is that nothing occurred, how do they prove to us that nothing occurred? Will we believe them? I wonder about that.